David St. Jacques, more than 200 days in space. The Canadian Space Agency doctor says it takes about a day to recover for every day spent in space. I'm hoping for your sake that's an exaggeration, but how are you doing? Well, I mean, I'm doing better every heartbeat, it seems. So initial recovery was very fast, and then it, it tapers off. And, but we're not there yet, but I'm kind of functional. If I can uh, describe it better, you come back from space where you've been completely adapted for a long time, uh, feeling very comfortable in space. Uh, and then very brutally, your body has to readapt to gravity. And uh, there's two, I mean, there's several problems, but the main ones are that um, when you get to orbit, initially your mind is very confused because whenever you move your head and what you see rotates, your inner ear fails to sense any change in which way is up or down mm. because there is no up or down right. in space. So that's very confusing. So quickly your mind for, figures out how to just disconnect that sensor, your inner ear, our vestibular system. And once you're forgetting about that, it's very comfortable. You spend hundreds of days in space, floating around, tumbling around, doing cartwheels, no problem. When you come back to Earth, suddenly you get the sense of up and down again, and your brain has to learn how to match that with what you see. And that is very nauseating, and it means that you cannot walk straight. As soon as you move, your mind is confused. You need to hold someone's hand. So for the first two days, really, uh, it's very, very uh, uh, destabilizing. The other problem is your blood pressure. You're here standing on Earth, and you know, it's, your blood wants to fall to your feet, but your body knows how to compensate for that and send more blood to your brain. And you're okay, you're fine. You go to space, it means you get a really big, red, puffy head and tiny, white, skinny legs, and quickly your body learns to fix that, and you're happy in space for hundreds of days. You come back to Earth, your blood just falls to your feet. You get big, red, swollen feet, and you're all pale and ghastly because you're, and you're about to faint. So these two things really make you useless for a few days. You knew what to expect as far as coming back, but I was it worse it, than you expected or? I knew, you know what I did not, ex I, I expected all these physical problems. I didn't expect they would make me so uh, foggy. We call it space brains. You're like, you know, you just want to be left alone <laughs> a little bit. Uh, you feel like uh, you want to sleep. You, it makes you mentally uh, kind of dim. You know, uh, so that sounds like something you'd want to get over. Yeah, that's <laughs> the mo and because your family is there, your friends are there, your loved ones are there. You just want to embrace them and join the party, and you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but that has gotten much better. So uh, that uh, space fog is gone, and uh, I'm just still physically. You know, I need to take a break from time to time. I saw I mean, you come down the stairs. It was a little slow. Yeah, I haven't yeah. dared ride a bicycle yet. You know? <laughs> so we'll get there. Fair enough. Yeah. The well, space exploration aside for a moment, you're also somebody who enjoys photography, and I saw yes. a bunch of incredible shots that you took. As somebody who likes photography, what was it like to have that opportunity? Sometimes, I mean, it was always fun to be able to share it, but uh, like any photography, outdoor photography, uh, uh, you know it doesn't really do it justice. Mm. Right, so uh, I look at those photos and I know, oh yeah, that's a small part of that whole site, that whole vision. But I've been trying my best to capture the feeling of the Earth as a sphere there in space, and the, the Earth, the limb of the Earth, uh, and the perspective that it gives you, how big things are, uh, the scale of things. Uh, so it was my daily, whenever I could, I would go to the window and, and play that game to myself. Where are we now? and see if I can recognize. Quickly, you can recognize continents. Mm -hmm. You can eventually recognize, oh, this is gonna be Europe. Oh, that's gonna be Africa. Oh, that's North America, that's South America. Uh, we have a say uh, among ourselves, if it looks strange, or you're not sure where it is, it's Australia. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did see Vancouver, I saw Edmonton, and I saw the Eastern Townships, very close to where we are right now. Very easy to recognize Canada from space, yeah. It's very distinct uh, kind of ground features. The, uh, yeah, hmm. yeah. And what the coastlines, of course. Yeah. Like, what about, um, I wanted to ask you, you're up there that long. Was there a highlight? Um, a better question. How much of a highlight was that spacewalk? Because I think that's what you'd have answered if I'd asked. Spacewalk was definitely one of the major highlights. There were several highlights. Yeah. Uh, the launch, the, the ride on the Soyuz rocket is definitely a huge part of what I remember from the whole experience uh, forever. Uh, that 
feeling of being pushed up away from Earth, uh, very, very powerful, uh, squished in your seat by the acceleration, and it only takes 10 minutes, and then the engine stops, and then you know, your pen you're using to make notes floats around in your seat. That's my first vision of zero gravity. And then it was nighttime when we reached orbit. Um, and quickly, we saw our first sunrise. So through a little porthole of my window in the Soyuz, uh, saw the limb of the Earth, the thin blue line as an arc with an orange line above it. The sun is creeping from behind. Spectacular. Yeah, spectacular. I mean, even though it was through, you know, a kind of a tiny porthole at a funny angle with reflections, that vision is still, it's burned into my memory. My first view of the Earth from space. Very strong. And then, uh, of course, other moments, uh, preparing for the spacewalk. And the spacewalk itself, getting out of the door the first time, um, that's a very strong, uh, very strong emotional memory. Uh, and it's a, it was an interesting um, realization to myself. I, because so many people ask you questions about it in, in anticipation, one of the questions people would ask is, I wonder if that would make you feel very small. You know, to be alone there, and it surprisingly not. As a in my own little, you know, the spacesuit is like a little spacecraft mm -hmm. in the shape of a human body with everything it, it needs to keep you alive. There I was, a satellite of Earth, looking at the whole planet below me and space station next to me, with the voice, friendly voice of mission control in my ear set. I didn't feel alone. You know, I, I was working with my friend Anne. Full out conversation all conversation the time. Conversation with my friend Anne, my colleague and crewmate Anne was there with me. Capcom on the ground, talking to me with technical details. Never felt alone. Felt comfortable. And I was thinking of our planet and our civilization and a human being. Of course you think, wow, one human is tiny. Try to imagine how big is a human being on Earth. Tiny, but the reach of the human soul is huge. Here I am representing humanity, mm -hmm. wearing this suit that's keeping me alive, that's the product of the imagination of people on the ground, doing a spacewalk that's been designed by people on the ground. So the reach of the human soul is immense. So it makes you feel like you're part of this huge, powerful, beautiful force, which is the human imagination, human collaboration. And what we can do when we work together is, is incredible. So, I didn't feel tiny at all. I felt like I was part of something immense. Which is actually the case, because the case? so many governments and countries are involved in this. That's mm -hmm. a, a good way to think about it. Yeah. You got some really neat shots of yourself while you're out there, too. Yeah, <laughs> this all ran, it was just uh, blind luck. <laughs> yeah. Well, normally those shots have the visor down, but you've got some really neat ones where you see your face completely in this. You know, actually, I got lucky. Yeah? I got I was, lucky because- I was wondering about that. I got lucky because a spacewalk is a very, very busy yeah. uh, operation. You prepare for it for, I mean, years, basically, including the training on the ground, thousands of hours. Specifically for that one spacewalk, uh, we have all this training, virtual training. You know, every move you're going to make, people on the ground are watching you every step with many te television views and helmet cam views. And, you know, time is of the essence because you have only so many hours of life support resources. We're not messing around. So you're busy checking your spacesuit, making sure everything is okay, doing your work correctly, talking with everybody you need to talk to, very, very busy. Every so often, you look at the Earth, go, wow. I can go back to work, <laughs> okay? And you try to integrate that sight, uh, that perception, to in that new perspective. And then at some point, during one of my tasks, I had a problem. Some part would not fit somewhere, and I try again. Of course, you blame yourself first. Oh, maybe I'm not understanding which way it goes. Try to put it another way around doesn't work. I really think it doesn't work. I look around, and then I make a call. I say, I think this is just not going to work. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm showing you in my camera view. What do you think? And then he said, OK, stand by. So then I had five minutes to myself wow. in my spacesuit outside station uh, with nothing else to do but to absorb the experience. Go so take advantage of it for take a moment. Take advantage of it, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I thought, OK, I'll try to do a selfie. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's how. It, that's when I took those photos. It's a, they're yeah. good ones. There are yeah. a couple of really good ones. Yeah, you're up there in space. I saw the video of you repairing the toilet and making the comment that help's not coming if you can't fix it. That's right. Um, how <laughs> you have a lot of stuff to get used to up there, living in space. Um, how tired did you get of some of that stuff, like Velcro and Ziploc bags? None. You no? don't. I mean, well, it, it becomes <laughs> your life. Uh, you know, you. 
it's clearly a dangerous thing to do, to go to space, right? And so once you enter a space station, this is your home, and you have a very, very strongly vested interest in keeping station running, making it work. It's your responsibility to make, make good use of it, do good research with it. Scientists on the ground spend so much time preparing experiments, you don't want to mess that up. So everything you do seems to have a very high value. And you spend 50% of your time just keeping the space station going about Basically, it. yeah, 50% maintenance, preventative maintenance, uh, or repairs, mm -hmm. um, and 50% using station, doing experiments, roughly speaking. It, it varies. But, but it shows you how much work it takes to keep it going. Yeah, but you are living inside the machine that keeps you alive. You want it to work well. <laughs> I, I can see that. And yeah. uh, it's a funny thing when um, the first when it hits you, um, you know, you enter a space station, and it looks like a home. It's been well designed, you know, with the crew psychology in mind. You got a floor, a ceiling, walls. It's all notional, but they can they make it look like a home. So psychologically, you feel comfortable, mm -hmm. and the walls are neat and smooth, and you know, there's buttons, and it looks like everything looks like you would you, and it's something you could meet on Earth. But every so often, you have to open those racks, open those walls to thick, and you realize, oh, there's machinery everywhere behind it. There's plumbing, piping, machineries, computers, tanks, valves. You are living inside a life support machine. This is going to seem like a strange thing to say, but when you were fixing that toilet, I was looking at the plumbing and going, my God, that's incredibly complex. Every, every panel on station looks like that behind. Yeah. But the, it's hidden from view so that psychologically it feels more comfortable and it feels like your office or your lab or your home, which is what it is all in one. Station is your home, yeah. your lab, your office, all in one. That's kind of important. That It makes you uh, emotionally, psychologically think this is home. Very important. Very, very important. And it's, uh, that's one uh, kind of not hidden, but re more rarely spoken of uh, aspect of, uh, you know, human space flight, because there's humans in the loop, it's got to be humanly livable. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of effort put into making this comfortable uh, so that you can be more functional. There's also a lot of effort that goes into making it happen um, on a personal level, because most business trips don't last six months. Yeah. How's the family? So I'm glad you asked the question, because this, is, this was, to me, the biggest challenge of the mission. And I think that was the the right way to look at it. I always thought, okay, I've been selected to do this. I probably have the basic skills. Then I've been trained for years and years. You know, I think I have the, the good knowledge. And once I go to space, I felt confident that I could do the tasks with work and effort mm -hmm. and application. But I always felt confident that uh, we, we can do this together with ground control and with everybody helping me. The real challenge was, how can my family handle this? And it's not just the six months in space. It's the three years of endless travel around mm -hmm. the world for training. That's actually maybe a bigger difficulty. And that's the phase during which the family, your spouse, your children get used to you not being there and how we're going to function. Uh, how, we're gonna, how do you maintain your role as a husband, as a father, as a son, as a friend, while you're never there physically? And there are ways to, but it takes... Uh, a lot of creativity, imagination, and I'm, I'm blessed with a genius spouse who is uh, my wife, Veronique, has just done an amazing job at uh, normalizing this for herself, for her sanity, yeah. and for our children. Because, you know, children basically adapt. They, they adapt and they absorb the emotions of the people that take care of them, mm -hmm. right? And if, if mommy thinks this is okay, well, it's probably okay. And that for them, that was just their norm. Yeah, but, but it is it to a cost. Take... To me, it's you know. To me, it was I was I missed them terribly. You know, my daughter was born when I was assigned for this mission. I've been gone all her life. And she, ouch, that's a tough way to put it. Yeah, and she just turned three, and uh, here's this guy that kind of only knows from the iPad. <laughs> wow. And, and the reunion was beautiful. Yeah. You went to space on a Soyuz rocket. Yeah. That's a technology that was developed in 1966. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they've improved it in, uh, over the years. But since then, I mean, the space shuttle was developed, designed, uh, and retired. You were the first person to go into 
a brand new spacecraft, uh, the SpaceX Crew Dragon. That's right. That's the first new spaceship to take humans into space that's been developed in 40 years. You're, you're correct. Yeah. How important is that? It was, very, uh, it was a pretty emotional moment. It's like a glimpse of uh, the future, of a new era. Uh, I mean, it looks completely different. It's from, beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, my first reaction was, ah, hey, this is like, a, you know, like the business uh, section of an aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, um, and uh, um, it was a glimpse of the future. Yeah, it was a glimpse of the future. There are two other ships coming too. Uh, like, there's a lot of technology that's going to change in the coming few years. Yeah, so uh, Boeing also have a spacecraft that's being designed. NASA herself has another spacecraft oh, that's so on the plans. Yeah, uh, so they things will uh, things will change. There'll be evolutions. Uh, even the Russian space program, they have another. They're kind of an evolved oh, really? version. Yeah, on the on the drawing board. Uh, so there's uh, there's always evolution, but. You know, the Soyuz is an amazing spacecraft. I, w I, want, I want to take nothing away from it. Amazing spacecraft. It well, is it, so utterly reliable. It may not be the most comfortable. Yeah. But and it's ridiculous that it's still in operation and, and doing as well as it, it and does. And that's because it was a genius design from the beginning. Yeah. Genius design. Yeah. There's always a way out, I'd like to say. With the Soyuz, there's always an escape uh -huh. door somewhere. There you go. There's always a way out of any problem. Looking at a new spaceship come online, it makes you think about the future. What should Canadians know about sort of the importance, the value, or the return on investment of space exploration in the coming 10, 20 years? So space exploration is part of, more globally speaking, this is what we do to evolve. So space exploration will, it will never be the priority. Priority will always be things like education, mm -hmm. healthcare, the economy, security, employment. These are the basic things that we must do to be comfortable, to be alive. But throughout the history of humanity, we've always kept a little fraction of our energy, of our resources, for dreaming, for the arts, for science, and for exploration. And with that little fraction of our energy that we keep for those extra things, that's how we progress. That's how we got out of the caves, invented writing, invented, you know, I don't know, horse riding initially, dared to go through the desert, dared to climb mountains, dared to go in, in the sea, dared to invent all the beauty that we have around us now. So civilization is the result of that little extra. And every generation can do a little extra for humanity's culture and civilization, knowledge, and advancement. So space exploration is one of those things that we do to progress. And so it's not like it's a luxury or an extra little, you know, a, a foolish adventure. No, it's part of, this is, it's the excuse for progress in a way. We're looking yeah. at Apollo 11 right now, there and we wouldn't have the computers we have today if they hadn't pushed technology, developed technology specifically for those missions. You're correct. The, the harshness of the environment of space is such that it forces us to scratch our heads and f come up with solutions that we would not have really even thought about otherwise. But once we have this new invention, hey, then of course we use it for, for the greater good. So uh, to me, that's the Canada I want for my children. A Canada that's bold, daring to innovate. And that's part of the game. Part of, part of the big global yeah. game in that little club of nations that are actually pushing the envelope, that are making us better, stronger, smarter, and uh, more collaborative. That's another aspect of space exploration that I think is sometimes overlooked. Mm -hmm. How, despite the real political problems that exist between nations, we should never dismiss them, they're real, they're hard to fix. Despite that, space continues to be one arena where we collaborate, and I've always done. Through the depth of the Cold War, we have collaborated around the world. Right. And to this day, we continue. And professionally, it is one of my greatest source of pride that you know, I've just spent the last several years of my career working hard at a very personal level with people from around the world uh, to accomplish these incredible things. And thanks to a collaboration. So when we go up beyond our differences, it's amazing what we can do. You were selected 10 years ago. That's right. 
I've covered you many, many times and seen mm -hmm. you give speech after speech and debriefs and, mm -hmm. and it felt like you were the PR person for the CSA. You waited a long time. I'm not going to ask you if it was worth it because I have no doubt it was, but was there a point where you said, this is why all the work and the wait was worth it? Well, I mean, definitely on the day of launch. Strapping uh, yourself in? Strapping myself in, like, okay, this is reality. This is reality. And suddenly, after all these hours spent you know, in a simulator, you walk up the ladder to the rocket. There's just you and your two crew members. Everybody else is going away because there's about to be a lot of <laughs> fire yeah. and prime. Yeah. Uh, and we are alone in our rockets, trapped in, check our systems, and uh, this is reality. This is happening. This is not a game anymore. Yeah. Finally happening. Finally happening, um, and so many people, I mean, I'm beyond, my family, of course, has put a lot of effort and sacrifices but for But the this. people here at the space agency as well? Yeah, around the world, so many people. You're, you're you know, you all, it's easy to just see the astronauts because we're the very visible face of space exploration. Uh, and we do have an important role, but it's not the most important role. It's just one of the roles that have to work well. Everybody has to do their job well. For, space, uh, for a space mission to function. So it's like a sigh of relief for everybody. But I'm right, it was worth it? Totally worth it, totally worth it. <laughs> but worth it is a lot of effort. But you know, there's nothing, nothing uh, valuable that's not, that doesn't require effort.